Test, test, test.
hymns for our opening hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. Palm Sunday Gospel comes from Luke chapter 20, or 19, beginning in verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out the gospel of the Lord. Thank you. 
You may be seated. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Well, welcome to Faith Lutheran Church on this Palm Sunday. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and we gather in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, so we too are blessed. And so we welcome you here, and good job, kids, on the Palm Procession. You guys, you guys are just naturals at that, and uh, thanks for helping us with our worship. We want to welcome those visiting with us today. We're so grateful that you are here. And we want to welcome those listening by radio broadcast this morning. That broadcast is sponsored by Nikki Perkinowski in honor of our First Communion kids, our 2022 First Communicants, who will receive their First, communi their first Communion this Thursday night. And so we're excited for them. And we want to thank Nikki for not only sponsoring the radio broadcast, but also all, all her work that she does with our First Communion kids. Well, today is Palm and Passion Sunday. We began celebrating the triumphal entry and we progress to the Passion of the Christ. This service features a long Passion reading. Uh, you have a copy of it in your bulletin. We encourage you to follow along during the reading. Um, there are some parts for you in there, the bold parts, and so be ready to, um, uh, um, to say your lines. We want to thank uh, our readers for that as well. Um, because of the long reading and because we have communion um, not only on Thursday but also next Sunday, Easter Sunday, uh, we will not be celebrating Holy Communion today. And then uh, don't forget about the new tradition that we began last year, our Palm Sunday breakfast. Our uh, mission trip kids are whipping up breakfast right now and we're going to start to smell it soon. Uh, you're not allowed to leave worship early to go and eat that, but uh, it will be ready for you after worship. We invite you down to the Faith Center for some really good egg bake and pancakes and some good, good fellowship. Because of that, there's no digging deeper today, so you got lots of time to eat and enjoy. This afternoon is uh, Faith Family Fun Paint Day. Uh, this is for all ages. Come on out and uh, from 2 to 4 and create some beautiful artwork. And our most important announcement today is in part an invitation, uh, partly a beckoning, and I pray uh, a Holy Spirit call for you to continue um, to journey with us during this most important week of the year, uh, Holy Week. This Thursday, Monday, Thursday, we have services at 6 and 7.30. Um, our First Communion kids will be receiving their First Communion at that time. And then we're excited uh, to be back with Christ the King on Good Friday this year. Um, we'll have our noon service at Good Friday, 6.30 service uh, here at Faith Lutheran Church. It features the seven last words from Christ on the cross. You're welcome to attend either church or both. Come to both. Um, but it's a beautiful tenebrae service, and um, we encourage you to be there. And then next Sunday, Easter Sunday, uh, sunrise service at 6 a.m., led by our Faith Lutheran youth. And then 8 o'clock and 9.30 festival Easter worship and 11 a.m. Um, festival worship in the foundation style, but in the sanctuary here. So lots of wonderful worship opportunities. We do encourage you to enter into that journey with us. We are still, look, still looking for some help on Monday, Thursday, and Easter Sunday. You see that um, opportunity of the week in your bulletin. In particular, we are looking for some ushers for Easter Sunday at 6, 8, and 11. Uh, if you can help out with that, uh, please let Marcia know, and we would be really grateful for that. Just a few uh, short announcements. We're looking for some able-bodied help next Saturday to set up tables for the rummage sale. Uh, they're going to start working at 9 a.m., so if you're able to help, that would be wonderful. Uh, do check out the lost and found over in the north entrance. It looks like a little store set up, but that's all lost stuff that needs to be found. Uh, whatever is not taking will be given to the rummage sale, but... Um, some people are missing some jackets and sweatshirts and all sorts of things. And then do note the nice thank you that we received for our Ukraine refugee support. You're going to want to uh, take a look at that. Uh, there's, and there's plenty more in there, so do make sure you read that. But uh, as we continue, let's rise and greet one another with the peace of Christ.
Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Let's pray. Almighty God, you sent your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, to take our flesh upon him and to suffer death on the cross. Grant that we may share in his obedience to your will and in the glorious victory of his resurrection through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we invite children to come forward for faith seeds. Bring your palm branches. And bring, yeah, bring your palm branches. <laughs> Hey, McCoy. So it's a beautiful morning. It's Palm Sunday, and Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us. So it's really a happy time. Can you think of a time when you were really happy, like a, something great happened? Yeah, Grady. Oh, that's a really happy time. You were a blessing. So, or maybe your birthday party, or, and, and Clara and Heidi, you have a baby coming too. <laughs> oh. Well, you know what? Jesus, he was riding on the donkey, and everyone was all excited. Can everyone wave their branches? Hosanna, Hosanna. And, but you know what? Jesus, we know the real story, but they thought he was going to save them from the, the politicians, and we can kind of relate to that. <laughs> and, but he had a different agenda. And you know how sometimes maybe your parents tell you to do something and you don't quite understand? Well, they kind of know better. Well, God really knows better. And so when he rode in on the, when Jesus rode in on the donkey and everyone was all excited, it was a good time. But unfortunately, Jesus had a different agenda. He knew that he had to die for us to save us. So unfortunately, it won't, it won't be a good ending for him, but it's a beautiful ending for us. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to save us. Help us to trust and put our faith in you. In his name, amen. Thank you, and you can wave your branches going back. <laughs> Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was one of the twelve. He conferred with the chief priests and the officers of the temple police about how he might betray Jesus to them. They were greatly pleased and agreed to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of the unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John. Go, prepare the Passover meal that we may eat it. Where do you want us to make preparations for it? 
When you have entered into the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, already furnished. Make preparations for us there. They found everything as he had told them. They prepared the Passover meal. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table with the apostles. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them could it be who would do this? Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and death. I tell you, Peter, the cock will not crow this day until you've denied three times that you know me. He came out and went as he was accustomed to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly. His sweat became like great drops of blood falling on the ground. When he got up from prayer, he found the disciples sleeping because of grief. Why are you sleeping? Get up and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. While he was speaking, suddenly a crowd came, and Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. Judas? Is it with a kiss you betray the Son of Man? Those around him, seeing what was coming, asked, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus said, No more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple police, and the elders who had come for him, Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. They seized him and led him away to the high priest's house. Peter followed at a distance. They kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down. Peter sat among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him in the firelight, stared at him. This man also was with him. Woman, I do not know him. A little later, someone else on seeing him said, You also are one of them. Woman, I am not. About an hour later, still another kept insisting, Surely this man was with him. He is a Galilean. Woman, I do not know what you are talking about. While he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then he remembered the word of the Lord. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and whipped wept bitterly. Now the men who were holding Jesus began to mock him and beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? They kept heaping many other insults on him. When day came, the assembly of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and scribes, gathered together, and they brought him to their council. If you are the Messiah, tell us. If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I question you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Are you then the Son of God? You say that I am. What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Then, as the assembly rose as a body, brought Jesus before Pilate and began to accuse him. 
we found this man perverting our nation, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor, and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. Then Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You say so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and crowds, I find no basis of accusation against this man. He stirs up the people by teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee where he began to this place. When Pilate heard he was a Galilean, he sent him off to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad. He had been wanting to see him for a long time, for he had heard about him and was hoping to see him perform a sign. He questioned him at some length, but Jesus gave no answer. The chief priests and scribes stood by, vehemently accusing him. Herod, with his soldiers, treated him with contempt and mocked him. He put, an, put on him an elegant robe and sent him back to Pilate. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. Pilate called together the chief priests, the leaders, and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was pre perverting the people. I have examined him in your presence and have not found him guilty of any of your charges. Neither has Herod, for he sent it back to us. He has done nothing to deserve death. I will therefore have him flogged and release him. Away with this fellow. Release Barabbas for us. This was a man put in prison for an insurrection that had taken place in the city and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no ground for the sentence of death. I will, therefore, have him flogged, and then release him. But they kept urgently demanding with loud shouts that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate released the man put in prison for insurrection and murder and handed Jesus over. As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, laid the cross on him, and made him carry it behind Jesus. Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death. They came to the place called the Skull and crucified Jesus with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. The people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him. He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God. He, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine. <laughs> if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription over him read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals kept deriding him. Are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? We indeed have been condemned justly, getting what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, while the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus cried with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. When all the crowds who had gathered there for the spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. But all his acquaintances, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance, watching these things. Now there was a good and righteous man named Joseph, who, though a member of the council, 
had not agreed to their plan and action. He came from the Jewish town of Arimathea, and he was waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and laid it in a rock-hewn tomb where no one had ever been laid. It was the day of preparation, and the Sabbath was beginning. The women who had come from Galilee followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was in high school and college, I spent a fair amount of time in a variety of theatrical productions, but I never had a chance to try improv. In improv, there is no script for actors to memorize or even an outline to follow. They simply improvise each line based on whatever comments the others make. And so the fundamental rule of improv is yes and. That is, the first step is to accept or say yes to whatever you hear. And then the and is your response to keep the conversation going. So if one person says, I found a little green Martian in my backyard this morning, the response could be, yes, and I heard he was sleeping in your doghouse. <laughs> to which the first person replies, yes, he was, and now my dog has greenish fur. And so it goes. Building ridiculous and sometimes ridiculously funny stories just out of quick thinking and creative ideas. Well, Christian theology has a similar vibe, except that its first rule seems to be, yes, but. When Christians proclaim the great promises of our faith, we very often have to say, well, yes, that's true, but, for example, yes, Jesus frees you from your sins, but of course you'll keep on sinning. Or, yes, Jesus' resurrection destroyed the power of death, but of course we'll all still die one day. Or, yes, Jesus will return in glory, but it has been 2,000 years already and we have no idea how much longer it'll be. I mean, it's a little wonder that the author of Hebrews defined faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Well, one of the most obvious of those yes, but issues lies at the heart of Palm Sunday and the passion of our Lord. On the one hand, we confess that Jesus' ride into Jerusalem was a royal procession because he is the King and Lord of the universe. In fact, as we heard, Luke's account of Palm Sunday records the crowd explicitly making that claim. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. But then we face the same conundrum as those Palm Sunday crowds did that Jesus didn't make one further move that appeared even remotely royal. He didn't raise an army. He didn't attack the powers that be. He forbade his disciples from fighting back against his captors. And he silently endured false and malicious accusations against him. And perhaps least royal of all, 
he meekly went to an unjust execution as his enemies mocked and insulted him. And so we're left to sputter, well, yes, Jesus really is a king, but he just didn't show a shred of evidence for it. And scholars then rush in to point out that Jesus rode a donkey instead of a war horse, meaning he came in humility, not royal pride. They assure us that he never actually claimed to be king in any worldly sense, but only in a spiritual kingdom. His silence before his accusers just shows his better character. So, yes, Jesus was a king, but no, he really wasn't a king. Got it? But what if we've been too quick to dismiss or tried to explain away the acclamation of the Palm Sunday crowd that Jesus is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. In his commentary on Luke, David Teedy notes those Pharisees who tried to get Jesus to tone down the celebration a bit. Teacher, order your disciples to stop. T.D. writes, they wanted to avoid any appearance of a political confrontation. I mean, such a demonstration as this could provoke a violent reaction from the people in power. It could be misunderstood, or worse, it could be understood. Jesus was entering Jerusalem as the king of God's own choosing. Well, I think T.D. is right. Because a careful reading of the Passion Gospel shows that Jesus did confront the powers that be. He made bold claims of kingship, and not just in some spiritual sense, but over against those who claimed to have authority over him. He didn't do it according to their rules and expectations, but he stood as a king among kings all around him, and thereby disclosed the nature of his rule and the limits of theirs. I mean, first up were Judas, the chief priests and temple police who came to arrest him. Jesus first named their hypocrisy in arresting him at night out of sight of his supporters. If you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? I mean, when I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But then he exposed the real battle that was now underway. This is your hour and the power of darkness. And the obvious implication of that he left unsaid. My hour is coming, and the power of light. Next came the kangaroo court trial before the Sanhedrin. I mean, Israel hadn't had its own king for some 600 years, but these religious leaders were the next closest thing. And Jesus stood before them as their prisoner. Yet he boldly declared his authority over them. From now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And at that point, thinking that they'd caught him in the ultimate blasphemy, they shot back, are you then the Son of God? And in a delicious twist of irony, Jesus replied, Well, you just said that I am, so it must be true. They had confessed with their own lips the truth that Jesus is the king. It was a similar scene with Pontius Pilate. I mean, his title was governor, but he represented the Roman emperor, the most powerful king in the world. 
Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Because that was the only issue that concerned him. I mean, if Jesus had made that claim, it would constitute treason. And that would give Pilate the excuse he needed to execute him and get the chief priests off his back. But again, Jesus turned the tables on his accuser. You say so, he answered. Not only implying that if Pilate said it, it must be true, but implicitly admitting that it was, in fact, the case. Jesus is the king of the Jews, and indeed even of Pilate and of the emperor. And the last king to confront Jesus was Herod Antipas. He wasn't officially a king either, although he desperately wanted Rome to grant him that title, as it had to his father, Herod the Great. But if Antipas didn't have a royal title, he did have all the power of a king, which he had used to behead John the Baptist. And yet, no matter how he questioned Jesus, he got no answer and certainly no miraculous sign. Jesus wasn't about to dignify this buffoon with any response. I mean, he may have been the one who was bound and mocked, but he far outranked the would-be king who accused him. And Jesus' last claim to kingship is the most incongruous, the least likely of all. As he hung on the cross, dying a cursed death, the brigand next to him made his absurd request. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Kingdom? <laughs> what kingdom? Jesus was about to die under the charge that any claim that he was the king of the Jews was blatantly false. And yet, without hesitation, Jesus accepted that bizarre accolade and boldly promised, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was a royal grant of clemency. You see, in all these situations, Jesus did not merely imitate a king or claim some spiritual power that transcended the earthly reign of his enemies. He claimed, implicitly but unmistakably, that he was a real, live, actual king whose authority exceeded all of theirs. And that, of course, is why they had to kill him. I mean, if his regal presence actually overshadowed their little fiefdoms and threatened their claims to authority, well, they could not tolerate that. They could not recognize or submit to a king who seemed to them to be only deluded and dangerous. And that's where the story of Jesus' suffering and death ends. As the Passion Gospel concludes, the question hangs in the air. Is Jesus really the king of God's own choosing? Or were his enemies correct in judging him to be an illegitimate fraud? I mean, surely his death on the cross would rid them of this troublemaker. Unless, of course, that wild rumor about his rising from the dead should come true. But even if it did, that would only make the danger he posed even greater. Stiffer measures would be required then to cut off this threat to their power. On the other hand, if Jesus' claim is true, 
if he is indeed the king among kings, who holds all authority in heaven and on earth, well, that means that he actually holds royal authority over me and you. It means that his kingdom does exceed every other kingdom and nation. It would mean that he is king of kings and lord of lords. And if that's the case, well, then nothing is more vital or essential than that you and I should heed his word and live as citizens of his realm. I mean, if Jesus really is a king among kings, it changes everything. Now and forever. Well, yes, but how can we know? I mean, how can we discern whether Jesus' royal claims are true or whether his profoundly unroyal appearance tells the real story? I mean, at this point, all we can do is watch and see how events, events unfold over this next week. I mean, it may just be that God has something else in store that will settle the matter once and for all. In the name of Jesus, amen.
I invite you to rise as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated as we continue to worship God with our tithes and offerings. Place is empty, no more traffic in the street. All the builders' tools are silent, no more time to harvest wheat. Busy housewives cease their labors in the courtroom. No debate. Work on earth has been suspended as the king comes through the gate. Happy faces lie in the hallway, those whose lives have been redeemed. Broken homes that he has mended, those from prison he has freed, little children and the aged, hand in hand stand all aglow, who were crippled, broken, ruined, clad in garments white as snow. The King is coming, the King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and soon his face I'll see. The King is coming, the King is coming, praise God, He's coming for me. I can hear the chariots rumble, I can see the marching throng, and the flurry of God's trumpet spells the end of sin and wrong. Regal robes are now unfolded. Heaven's grandstands stand all in place. Heaven's choir is now assembled. Start to sing amazing grace. The King is coming, the King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now His face I see. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. 
King is coming. Praise God, He is coming for me. Oh, the King is coming. The King is coming. I just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the King is coming, the King is coming. Praise God, he is coming. As we come to the prayers of the church, we do have a couple of additions to what is printed on our blue insert. We pray for Sue Graff, who is having surgery this Tuesday, and for Lori Swift and her family as her father, Lennon, goes into hospice. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, our King of Majesty, blessed are you. Your hour has come. Shine your light in the darkness of our lives. Thwart the power of sin and evil, just as you did on the way to the cross. Reign in majesty, in power, and in glory over us and over all creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, on this day of celebration, as we remember your son's triumphal entry, we also remember how quickly the tables turned. As we enter into Holy Week, draw us into the drama of Christ's passion. Quiet our lives, focus our thoughts, and gather us for worship, so that we may once again hear what you did for sinners like us, and how you turned the tables on death itself. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Mighty God, create in your church a hunger for having the same mind as Christ, so that our lives show forth a sense of humility and selflessness. Through our witness and the power of your Holy Spirit, bring us to the day when every knee shall bend and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Light of the nations, grant the light of your healing might might shine on those living in illness, addiction, loneliness, or anxiety. Be with Sue Graff during her surgery this week. Comfort Lori Swift and her family as they walk with her father through hospice. Bless them and all who suffer with your tender care and turn their mourning into joy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we thank you for our mission partners who are going the extra mile to support refugees from Ukraine. Bless and use the funds that we have sent and strengthen our partners for this vital but tiring work. And Lord, as we finish our food drive here in Hutchinson, bless and multiply the food that we've gathered. Continue to inspire us to feed the hungry and deliver the food to those who need it. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, almighty God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior, 
who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And get some breakfast. <laughs>